Okay, as we launch into to this particular parable or set of three parables, can I tell you guys something that I've observed about this guy? Can I tell you guys something I've observed about David? My anxiety just went up, <laughs> nervousness David, up. David, almost every time I'm with David, which is a lot, he loses things. He, <laughs> he often leaves his wallet or his keys in my truck or in some sofa or something. And then he just, he just takes off. He just, he just goes about his, his life. And then, and then where did I leave that? Right? I resemble that remark. You resemble that <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so, so there are a set of three parables in Luke 15 about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Let's get them all on the table as we've been doing. David, would you read the lost sheep, which is verse, Luke 15, verses one through what? One through? One to seven. One to seven. And then Jeffrey, how about you read the, the lost, coin, lost yeah. coin? Yeah, yeah, that's your favorite part, apparently. That was a lot of enthusiasm. <laughs> and then Cynthia, you can read about the lost boy, the lost son. Okay, so I'll go, I'll start here? Yeah. Uh, Luke chapter 15, beginning in verse 1, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes, com scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, says, saying to them, Rejoice with me. For I have found my sheep which was lost. Mm. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy mm. in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Hallelujah. Okay, you guys, get ready. Sheep, coin, now we have a human being in this remarkable story. Mm. I right. love this story. Verse 11, Then he said, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants." And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. Mm. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I make, might make merry with my friends. But as soon as the son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. Goodness. These are uh, so good, they require, they require no commentary. Yeah. The stories are so marvelous, especially the prodigal son. It just stands on its own. Doesn't it? Everybody understands this. You mm -hmm. cannot 
not understand what Jesus is saying. And it's beautiful. It's oh. attractive. The fact is that that the beginning of Luke 15 sets us up with this this idea of attraction, right? Mm -hmm. Because it says in verse one that there's a certain group of people, they're called tax collectors and sinners, and it says they drew near. They drew near to Jesus to hear what he had to say. They're attracted to him. It's spontaneous. It's not forced. There's something about him that is magnetic, and they're drawn to him. Oh, and good then word, in verse, good word. verse two, it says, but the Pharisees and scribes complained. So you, you've got You've got, on the one hand, a group of people that are attracted to Jesus. On the other hand, you've got a group of people who are repelled by Jesus. In the cleansing of the temple, for example, do you remember that some people are running out and then all of the children are running in? Yeah, and the lame and those that were, yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's Isn't right. That something? So attraction on the one hand and then others are just repelled by the, by the same person. Cynthia and I were talking as we were, as we were driving here to the studio this morning, and, and we were essentially just reveling in the idea that Jesus is so beautiful that if you strip away religion as it is represented in the world, it's really hard to not be drawn to Jesus. You would have to resist. You would have to somehow do some kind of mental gymnastics to not like this person, to not like Jesus. He's attractive. He's beautiful in every way. And he's uniquely beautiful. This is the point that I often make when I'm preaching and I say that Jesus is uninventable, right? Because you think about the, the great writers, the Ernest Hemingway, the Mark Twains and others, they're just drawing from human experience through human minds and writing down things that were amazing, well-crafted tales, well-crafted novels, no denial about their, their facility in writing but they're always writing within the stories that are available commonly to human beings. Mm. This is an otherworldly story. I mean, Jesus is not just from heaven. The depiction of him in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John reveals that. It proves that, it mm. discloses that. No human being, not a Hemingway, not a Twain, not a Dostoevsky could have written this story. Mm. It could not have been written by a human being. It had to be revealed. This is what Jesus means when he says, no one has seen the Father, but, but the only begotten yeah. Son who was in the bosom yeah. of the Father, he has revealed him. Mm. And mm. all that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are doing is, is r recording, detailing what actually happened. Yeah. I just, yeah, I'm with you on the attraction. So Jesus, Jesus is the shepherd. Jesus is the woman. Jesus is the Father in these three stories. In each case, there is a mad search going on. And the mad search is going on by the God of the universe. One of my favorite book titles ever, ever, ever. I know what you're gonna say. You know. Abraham Joshua Heschel. Yeah, yeah. God in Search of Man. And, and the title itself of that book just flips our paradigm because we normally perceive ourselves as the ones who are pursuing God. And we even say that. We'll yeah. say, oh, in, in 1993, I found God. I found God. Oh, where was he? Was he <laughs> hiding? You know? is, is God playing was under a game a of hide and seek? Well, well, Scripture portrays, Jesus portrays God as the one who is in hot pursuit of us. Not, yeah, not that we're trying to find him and he's evasive. He's not slippery. God's not slippery. He's not hiding. God is, what did you say twice now? He's biased to save. He's biased to save. He's, he, the whole system is rigged. There's an, an author I read that essentially said that in order to be lost, you have to resist. Yeah. Not in order to be saved, you have to try hard enough mm -hmm. in order to slip in by the skin of your teeth. But in order to be lost, you have to try really hard. You have to say no over and over and over again until you've created a psychological state of mind in which you can't be penetrated anymore. But as long as you can be penetrated, God is after you. He's pursuing you. And he is the hound of heaven. It's really hard to not be drawn to Jesus. Very hard. I mean, when I became a follower of Jesus at 23 years old, I was not drawn particularly to the religion itself or even to the epistles of Paul or the Old Testament. I started reading in the Gospel of Luke and particularly the story of him weeping over Jerusalem and the chapters leading up to that and after mm. that. And I was like, 
this dude's amazing. Yeah. I mean, there was an attraction. I loved your word. There was a magnetism there. Mm, mm. And I think that even people that are down on religion, you deal with a lot of these people in your work, people that are secular, not religious. You deal with a lot of these people, Jeffrey, in the academic setting. I think a high percentage of those people, correct me if I'm wrong here, would actually be up on Jesus. Yes. They'd be like, Jesus yeah. is cool. Now, the things I know about Jesus, you know, to the limited degree that they might be exposed, who doesn't like Jesus? Yeah, yeah you know, oh, go ahead. I actually have two people I just thought of when you said that. So one is a classmate from, of mine from business school, and I gave him Bible studies, and he actually reads the Bible now. He's actually praying, and but he is, doesn't want to call himself religious because of what you just said. There's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of <clears throat> negativity yeah, yeah. tied to religion. But he's like, well, but I really like Jesus. Yeah, it's very much what God. You said two people. Yep. So that was one person. The second person um, is a, a, a psychologist in Japan, and I was just giving him and my cousins Bible studies just for several months this year, and because that's what you do. Yes, it's, and he uh, actually uh, was not. He was kind of on the fence. He's like, oh, I don't know if I like this stuff. But after we went through the story of the gospel, he actually is like, you know what? I I, I like this guy. I can see why if you if you follow what this guy says, correct, you actually become a better person. Society becomes a better person. But he's not ready to call himself a Christian. Yeah. But he he's attracted, just like we're saying. Yeah, I feel I feel like that's perfect. Hallelujah. A lot of people would be attracted to Jesus. Christians and Christianity yeah. institutionalized. It's not mm. Gandhi. You know the whole I'd be a Christian. Well, if it wasn't for the Christians. If it wasn't for the Christians. Years ago, I read a street poll. I couldn't tell you where it's at. You'll, I mean, maybe you've read this, where uh, in some of the most developed countries and cities in the world, mm -hmm. and this was done in Copenhagen in particular, uh, they just walked up and down the streets with two questions. Um, do you have any interest in church? Eight out of 10 people said no, just walked off. But they, hey, we have a second question as you're walking away. How many of you, do you have any interest in Jesus? And the numbers just flipped. Wow. Eight out of 10 people said, yeah, Jesus, sure, Jesus, but church, no. And if you go throughout Western Europe, there are churches that are empty, that are converted to museums and concert halls because Christianity emptied out the church of Christ. Wow. Christianity Whoa, come on now. emptied out the church of Christ. I lived for a, a number of years, as, as you guys know, in a very secular part of the country in Eugene, Oregon, and there's a popular bumper sticker there. And the bumper sticker says, Jesus called the other day, said he wants his religion back. Wow. <clears throat> Another bumper sticker that says, Lord, save me from your people. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so <laughs> Jesus is attractive, isn't he? But this and, is actually what the verse is saying, right? Because the Pharisees, the, the church leaders of the day are mm -hmm. asking, wait a second, why are these people, yeah. why are you receiving them and spending time with them and eating with them? And these three parables are a response to that question. Yeah. Yeah, listen, to, listen to the way this translation renders it. This fellow welcomes sinners, they said. He even eats with them. Even. Even. And the welcome, the, not just to tolerate sinners, which would have been the height of magnanimity, yeah. but he welcomes them. Yeah. He even. In the vernacular, he hangs out. He hangs out he with hangs them. He hangs out with the crowd that you ought not to hang out with. And, and that, he seems to enjoy it. And that right there reveals. <laughs> he seems to enjoy it. That right there well, the sinners have it. the best food. <laughs> <laughs> that right there encapsulates what's so unattractive about religion. Yes. That entire disposition right there, that frame of yeah. mind, yeah. summarizes what's so whacked out about religion. Is there any exception to this pattern in the Gospels? I think there must be an exception to it, but I'm not thinking one of one off the top of my head. There's a pattern over and over again in which, in which there are religious individuals and immoral individuals, tax collectors, sinners, prostitutes, and over and over again in the Gospels, Jesus positions himself in such a way that the sinners are attracted and the religious people are repelled. I think oh, Nicodemus would be an exception. He was curious and went and met with him. At and night. probably there were other exceptions that are just not, you know, sort of described or enumerated mm -hmm. in the text. But yeah. overall, the yeah, picture, yeah. the portrait that's being painted is this, like you said, this yeah. repulsion and this attraction simultaneously. So, so can religion kind of inoculate a person against Jesus? Oh, yeah. Can Christianity make a person feel like... I've had people say to me, I don't know if you've been told this, but people have said to me over the years, I wish, these are people who are generational Christians, I wish I was a convert to Christianity like you. 
because I don't feel it the way you feel it. I've heard that. You had an empty canvas, Raz. Yeah. I don't think that's necessary, though, because... I know many people who were raised in it and they feel it very deeply. You were so, raised in a Christian context, yeah? But I left and came back. Okay, so you had that experience. But you see what I'm saying? Christianity, religion in general, can actually not only repel, but create a perception of God that is repelling, right? And when you say, when you say Christianity, Ty, tell me if I'm, if I'm mishearing you here. When I hear you say that, in my mind, I hear... Christianity. In other words, not authentic biblical religion. Right. Uh, to- mm-hmm. Scripture. Probably more accurately, Christendom. Okay, I, I like that. Yeah. I like that. Institutionalized religion. Yeah, I like that. Mm-hmm. I like that. And, and I, I think the religion thing very much. In an earlier parable, you asked the question, in an earlier episode about an earlier parable, you asked the question, does religion have the capacity, even the propensity, to cause people yeah. to, to be delusional. Yeah, because Christianity- I think the answer is yes. Christianity in, of, in and of itself is, is a word that can imply something good or something bad. Right. Religion isn't a bad Correct. word. Yeah. The Bible uses the word religion at least one time I can think of and just says it's basically visiting the widow and the, the orphan and providing for those who yeah. are in need. James. So religion isn't bad in and of itself. Christianity isn't bad in and of itself. In fact, they're supposed to be Good, right? In the hands of the right people, it's a huge blessing, but proportionate to how much of a blessing it is, in the hands of the wrong people, it's a complete disaster. So in the time of Jesus, the entire edifice of Judaism has created a repelling effect for the rest of the world, right? Judaism not correctly understood. Right. Yeah. So, can, can I say yeah. something about the parable? It's, uh, I want to, you know, to the degree that you guys are ready to, I, I really like how verse 3 sets this up. Verse 3 is really short. It just says, so he spoke this parable to them saying. The them here has to be those that are objecting to Jesus even eating with sinners, right? right. Because if you read it, it says, all the tax collectors and sinners are coming near. Then the Pharisees and scribes complain about this and says, this man welcomes sinners, he even eats with them. Mm. So Jesus is not saying this parable primarily to the lost. They're listening in, or not to the lost, those that would have symbolized the lostness of the coin, the sheep, yeah. and the son. He literally is saying this to them to try and woo them, to try and win them, to try yeah. and... Do you, you, don't do you get, feel you, that? You don't get me. Here's what I'm actually like. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I love that you say that you don't get me because on several occasions in Scripture, they will literally come to Jesus and to his disciples and say, why? Why do you fill in the... Why? Do, they don't get him. And how is it that you... Because the way we understand it, you Correct. ought not. You shouldn't be doing what you're doing. And, and you guys throw in whatever you want. But one of the things I want to say, one of the sort of threads that binds all the parables together, obviously the lostness, right? Lost sheep, lost coin, uh, lost son, but also the rejoicing, mm. right? Like that's on offer here. Rejoice with me for I have found my sheep which was lost. Rejoice with me for mm. I have found the peace which was lost. And then the whole party and everything that is thrown in the, re, uh, in, in the wake of the return of the sun is rejoicing. rejoicing. Yeah. So yeah. I, Jesus is saying, let, let me tell you what I'm about. I'm about finding lost things and then throwing yeah, really parties, happy, yeah. being super yeah, happy. Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah. in fact, it's not just me that's happy. That. Angels are happy. Yeah. Heaven is happy. I'm, a, I'm about finding lost things and, and throwing, throwing parties. parties. <laughs> Come on, David. That's it. That's, that's our God. That's the God of the universe, finding lost people and throwing parties. Yes. We'll, we'll take a break on that note and just, that's a lot to really, really think about and, and be happy about. Yes. God is attractive. Amen. Mm. Mm. The purpose of the Arise Intensives is to get people deeply and yet quickly into scripture. It takes place just over a weekend so that they can have a feel for the shape of what we call the story of scripture. And our goal is to move through the key parts of the biblical story in such a way that you wouldn't just know biblical ideas with your intellect, but that we would reach in through your intellect into your heart and that you would fall in love with Jesus as the most beautiful person in the universe. That's what our goal is. That's what we're up to. That's our agenda. When people leave, what we're hoping they go away with is a new sense of how to think like a Christian, to think biblically, 
Genesis to Revelation, not every detail, but the key truths of Scripture in one intense weekend, and that you would fall in love with Jesus. So before the break, we were we were launching into the we parables. were worshiping before yeah, the break. <laughs> we were launching into the parables themselves, and and I'm just my mind is just resting on this idea that the God of the universe is a God who finds lost people and throws parties. I mean, seriously, can not we just end right there? That's what just, I'm saying. We don't. Let's we don't get the guitar out. That. Let's sing. Is a God song. really like that? Let's pray. Is God really like that? He is like that. That's what these parables are telling us. Because there's other places where, where the same God is talking about tying rocks around people's necks and throwing <laughs> them into the ocean same. if they abuse children. Right. right? The thing is, I kind of like that personally. I, I, actually, I do <laughs> too. You know, because the same God who, who loves people doesn't love when people are hurt. Yeah. Right? His hatred you. for evil, his it's hatred for abuse yeah. is proportionate to his love for yeah. good. Okay, so what about the parables themselves? So, oh, can I just say something about yeah. that real quick? That reminded me when you said that, Jeffrey, about that great C.S. Lewis quote where he says, God is our heavenly father, not our heavenly grandfather. Right. Oh, right? Yes. Like, and a grandfather words, is just this benevolent, you know, old person that just indulges everybody. Here, have three more Snickers but bars. a dad loves and. You know, yeah, he yeah. loves and. The extension yeah. of that love is his, his hatred of of sin is the corollary of his love for people. But, but, but let's not lose where, where you took us. Right. The God of the universe finds lost things and, and throws, throws parties. And throws parties. <laughs> yes. And when people do things to hurt other people, to harm other people, to oppress other people, that deeply wounds right. the heart of God. And God loves even the wounder, yeah. even the oppressor. Whew, come on so do you, do, you, do you think that it's legitimate to picture the God of the universe in full on belly laughter around a table with, with people Zephaniah eating? Zephaniah says he's going to sing, doesn't it? He rejoices over us with singing. He what? sings. 217. Yeah. Well, he authored music. Yeah, yeah. And good food, flavor, <laughs> <Yeah>. taste. <laughs> okay, the, the parables themselves, though. So the lost sheep, what's going on there? What's going I, on with the lost sheep? I think sheep? the lost sheep is a very simple, easy to understand parable that would have made sense in an agricultural, agrarian context. Everybody would have immediately got it. You've, mm. Sheep are, are herd animals. They flock together. I've spent a lot of time in New Zealand, and there are like 10 sheep for every one person. Mm. In the back country of New Zealand, yeah. they're everywhere. And sometimes you'll even see shepherds out in the hills. I remember one yeah. time I was with my wife, and we were in the back country of Romania. And uh, we, were, we were way back into the bush, and sure enough, we come over this little rise, and here's a shepherd. And he's there with his sheep, and they're all together, and it was awesome. I got some of the most incredible photos of this shepherd with his sheep. Mm. And, and so sheep stick together, so if one has gone astray, he's been lost, he, he was busy, he found some great flowers or whatever to eat, or some great grass to eat, and, and the, the flock wandered away, mm -hmm. the shepherd knows that when he leaves the sheep, for the most part, they will not disperse. Yeah. They'll stay together, they'll aggregate, they'll do the, so he can go look for the one and everybody would have said, oh, okay, so God is like that. Yeah. God isn't just happy with the 90 and nine, God wants all 100 of his and 100. For some, and for someone like me, who's a city slicker and knows nothing about sheep, yeah. when I read this text, what sticks out to me is, how do you have 100 sheep and only one is missing and you actually notice. Mm. Oh, right? great point. So I just picture a whole mm -hmm. <laughs> beautiful sea of sheepies, white, <laughs> white, fluffy stuff, right? You How do you notice? Like her. And, yet, <laughs> and yet he knows when one is missing. And it reminds me of Matthew chapter 10, verse 30. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. Mm -hmm. So when I read this as yeah. a city slicker, I'm like, wow, it speaks to... Yeah. The intense intimacy, the individual yeah, yeah. intimacy yeah, yeah. to which God knows us at such a focus point. It, it's, it's I'm rejoicing again. Jeffrey, Jeffrey I underlined in uh, verse 7 and then again in verse 10, one. Mm. One center, one. one center, one. So 
he leaves the 99 and goes after the one, right? Think of John 3.16 in that context now. For God so loved the world, that's the large universal embrace of all of humanity, mm. that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever. Singular. So there's the world and then there's the whosoever. The whosoever is the individual person. This statement from C.S. Lewis blows my mind every time I read it. He died not for men, but for each man. If each man had been the only man made, he would have done no less. So is it hyperbole? Is it an exaggeration to say that if only one human being, just Jeffrey, just Cynthia, just David, just Ty, if just one human being had rebelled, fallen into sin, that God would have pursued that one to the ultimate self-sacrifice? That's just one. Suggests. Are you of that value? Am I of that value? Absolutely. I think that's exactly that's what, what, what suggests. this is suggesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can also put in the context of the universe, right? We have one tiny little planet. I don't know how many other planets of other beings there are, but this is like one little tiny planet, and he died for this one little tiny planet. It's Th incredible. Think about it this way. Human beings are infinitely valuable in the eyes of God because when God grants eternal life, when God gives immortality at the resurrection, they have a life then that, in the words of one author, measures with the life of God. Yeah. Mm. Right? What's that worth? Yeah. What, what is that worth to have one per with an infinite number of days, years, and moments that stretch out before her, that stretch out before him? Interacting with God. Interacting with God. The value of that is something that only God yeah. Is, yeah. has the capacity has the, 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 the understanding to grasp. You know, yeah. oh, go ahead. I was just going to say in the last parable, uh, the whole concept of love your neighbor as yourself, mm. right? And it just dawned on me, we asked, how, how could it be possible that if there was just one individual, uh, heaven would empty its resources for that one individual? But if in creation, individuals are made in the image of God, I'm just thinking the whole concept of, love your neighbor as yourself, right? So in other words, God values that one individual to the degree that he values himself. Love your neighbor as yourself, mm -hmm. right? So it's not, it, it's impossible for God not to empty all heaven to save one soul mm -hmm. because that soul is created in the image of God. Yeah. So in, in, it would be equivalent to an, a part of God is dying, if mm -hmm. we could use that mm -hmm. poetic language yeah, and not yeah, be yeah, literal yeah, with yeah, it, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Part of God is dying if only one soul. So it just shows the magnitude. Yeah. I, I would say it this way. I, I, I get your point, but I would say it that, that something of infinite value has been lost that God apprehends that value. Because if something's lost, it could have gone for, forever. Right, right, right. Now, well, think about it today. If, if we learn that a person that was 85 dies, that's sad. But when we learn that somebody is 18 and dies unexpectedly, tragically, we're sadder or we're more distraught or it just feels different because we know that what could have been was never realized. Yeah. God sees that on a cosmic yeah. scale. I love eternity. that. Yeah. He sees yeah. the potential. Yeah. Wow. wow. So the other thing I wanted to call out was verse five, because if you think about the inconvenience of having to go track down the lost sheep, I might be, if I were the shepherd, I might be a little impatient. You know, he probably, given how much he values this, he probably meant immediately, it might have been overnight, he might have been searching in the dark, I don't know. But the fact that when he found it, he's actually happy. He doesn't yeah. say like, Oh, good point. Idiot. Where were you? What happened? Yeah, like, Why did you where leave were the you? Flock? Like he was like, I love, I'm so thrilled, glad I found you. Throws I'm gonna him on pick the you up. I'm gonna yeah. pick you up. I'm gonna take carry you back. Like he's yeah, yeah. he's he doesn't he doesn't feel like yes. he's angry at the sheep. My my father in law, Violetta's dad, was a shepherd from the time he was eight years old in in you know Romania in a very different world than we live in now like a world that was more like the world of 500 years ago than 2021 and he said that this was not uncommon that you would often have sheep that would lag behind or they'd have an injury and, and you'd put them on your shoulders and they'll just mm. stay there mm. now, I spent a lot of time I mentioned in New Zealand sheep are very interesting animals very trusting in that a sheep will run from you it's very hard to catch a sheep but, but if you catch a sheep and you hold on to it, it immediately goes docile. Hmm. It just hmm. instantly, it just wilts and it'll just sit there. So well, like when sheep are sheared, they just, they just go limp, right? And then as soon as you let them go, they bolt off into the field. And so, hmm. so my father-in-law would say, you, you put the sheep on you, the lamb on you, and it will just lay there. It's almost like a, like a sack of potatoes. It just rests on you. Interesting. Awesome. You they're, said they're, they're trusting. Are they also stupid? 
Well, a lot of people. I'm talking about humans now. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of people think of sheep as stupid, but I don't think they're stupid as such. I just think that they're herd animals that find their safety in being in a in a group. And so when they're separated, they freak out. They don't like Mm. it. How can how can we not mention Psalm 23? Mm. Yes, the Lord is my shepherd. Begins with the Lord is my shepherd; I shall not want. Can you quote verse six, the final line? Surely. Goodness and goodness mercy, and mercy follow will me. Follow, follow me all the days of my life. So there's that idea of pursuit, right? God is pursuing the one. Pursuing. God is chasing after us, you guys. God and If you're man. running from God, all you have to do is stop and turn around and he'll crash right into you. And it says here, until he finds it, verse four. There's that relentlessness. No. He won't stop until he finds it. Do you want to move on to the coin? What's going on with the lost coin? What I mean, the coin, a coin is an inanimate object that a city slicker like you could better understand. Um, what's going talk on? Talk to us about the coins. <laughs> Tell us. What, what about the lost coin? Talk to us it's, about the Bitcoin. <laughs> the Bitcoin. <laughs> it seems perfectly parallel. I like the part, she sweeps the house and searches carefully hmm. until she finds it. And then there's rejoicing again. Yep. But one thing we skipped over from the previous one is I just want to hear your reaction to this, that there's joy in the presence of the angels Mm -hmm. of God over one Mm. sinner who repents. I wonder, where does the angelic world fit into all this? Mm. What does this say about the the fact that Scripture does speak about the angelic world interaction with humans? And And you can speak to that. You know, we can talk about the nature of angels. But but the cool thing here is that he's saying, why aren't you rejoicing? Because this is happening in a situation, right? All the sinners and tax collectors are coming to Jesus. These people are grumbling and he's saying, let me tell you, the angels, they're rejoicing over what's going on. My ministry, my healings, my messianic identity. Why aren't you? Yeah, so you're triggering something in my mind. So the 99 sheep and the, the nine coins that aren't lost, is this talking about the angels in the universe or is this talking about Israel? I think there are layers of application. Yeah, I think both are true, right? So, so, so he left the 99, he left all the unfallen worlds. But by the way, we don't know how many there are, but the Bible does explicitly teach that there are rulers and authorities in the heavenly realm, which implies population bases that are being ruled. And you, Job right? says so, other sons of God. Yeah, so there are other worlds, right, to quote. Certainly other beings. Yeah, so he left them to come to us. This is remarkable. According to the book of Ephesians and the book of Hebrews, not only did Jesus come for us, he is joined to us and with us for all eternity. He's a oh member God. of the human race forever and ever. Beautiful. Right? And I think that's one of the reasons that there's rejoicing among the angels. You remember 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12, where it, in the context of the gospel and redemption and its impact on humans, it says that this is something the angels desire mm. to look into. It's fascinating. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Is, it, is it a stretch to say that the, the, the lost sheep is lost in the wide world? And that the lost coin is lost in the house. Mm. Is it, I've heard that before. Yeah, the, that. the house would be the church or, you know, Israel. And that it's possible to be on the, to be an insider and an outsider simultaneously. And it's possible to be an outsider and an insider simultaneously. Exactly. Yeah, I wonder how, as we were sort of talking about the, the fact that the sheep is, is an organism, like it's a living creature, it knows it's lost. The coin doesn't actually even know it's lost. It's an inanimate, inanimate object. But how does, how do you think it would feel to be that person who was lost and know that someone's really searching for you? You mm. always hear these stories of people who are, you know, hiking somewhere or people who are lost somewhere in real life. Mm. And they sort of bank on the hope that someone's looking for them. And that they yeah. won't give up until they find yeah, you. Yeah, and that yeah. hope sustains a lot of people, right? right, right. I think it, it, when I ask the question, like, well, what does that feel like? I have a teeny little understanding of what that feels like. I was... Um, my parents, I was born in Switzerland, and my parents were hiking in the Alps it's with some friends. a great place to be born. <laughs> and I actually got lost. I was like three or four, three years old, maybe. And I got lost in the mountains. And Of Switzerland, no less. It wasn't that bad. It was more civilized than what you think. Um, <laughs> but I remember I was at a little rest area, and I turn around, and there's no one. There was my family and my brothers and with some friends. And I, was, I would turn around, nobody's there. I was terrified. I don't know if you realize what it's like because you've never been insecure in your life. Like you, 
Yeah. You always have your parents. And mm -hmm. I, I turn around, there's nobody there. It was instant terror. And mm -hmm. I'm just crying and I'm, I'm horrified. And my parents, of course, rushed back when they realized I wasn't with them. How yeah. long were you unfound? How long were you lost? Not that long, a few minutes. Like probably, I'm guessing, probably 15, 20 and minutes. And it felt like, it felt like five ages. hours. I was sobbing. I was Soon. like terrified. I'll tell you a funny story about that. My son, my youngest son, Jabel, we used to have this joke because he's just very in his own world, just kind of absent minded. And we used to joke that Jabel lives in his own world. And then every now and then he just makes, you know, cameo appearances in our world. And so when we would go to like the mall or the airport or whatever, we would, Landon would just stay right next to us, no problem. But Violet and I was, would always say, keep an eye on Jabel because he'll just wander off, totally oblivious. And we, we would do this thing where he would wander off and we'd watch it. Hey, watch Jabel. And he, he, we're letting him get way out ahead of us in a busy airport, an international airport, a mm. mall with hundreds of people. And we'd follow 40, 50, 60 feet behind. He doesn't notice. And one time we followed him around an entire mall. Mm. And then we finally were like, well, we've got to get going. It'd been like <laughs> 10 minutes. He's just oblivious, just wandering around doing it. And he was like five. Wow, wow. He's cool. So, he's so cool you were lost, lost and, and you it. as the lost one were terrified. So that's maybe the sheep, and right. your son is more like the coin. Yeah. We, <laughs> my son is the coin. Yeah. That's exactly right. My, my wife Sue and I, we nearly shut down a Macy's one time because we lost our little girl Leah. Oh, wow. Right? So you were terrified as the child that was lost. Mm. Is God terrified? We were terrified. We were like, as where parents. is she? Where is she? The whole time she was just in one of those roundy things. Yeah, you go the sit in the middle. Yeah, yeah, and of Jesus course. in the middle of all that. Little, little fort. Yeah. So, so is God in kind of a, 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 in a sense, not only in hot pursuit of us, but just really hoping against hope that yeah. we say yes and, and return with him. Very much so. Yeah. It has to be that way, doesn't it? God is feeling, according to of, of this course scripture, it is because, God feels things. Of course it is because God, the father here, mm. Jesus would be the father in the prodigal son and look at the response. The response is one of incredible relief, incredible celebration. Yeah. All of that concern, that anxiety mm -hmm. about where is my son? How is he doing? Is he even still alive? Right? They didn't have internet back then. How yeah. do you even know? Yeah. Yeah. You know, they didn't have phones. They didn't have, you know, the modern technological information that we have, information technologies. So when the sun comes walking over the hill, which I think we should talk about in the next session, because the, the sheep was sought and the coin was sought, but the sun wasn't sought. Right. The sun came to himself. He had an epiphany and he came back. And I'd be very interested to see what you guys think about that. All right, let's take a break. And when we come back, we'll just spend the rest of the time talking about the prodigal son. Closer Than Angels is a study of God's love for mankind that you will cherish and read over and over again. It is a message that will lift your mind to rare heights of spiritual contemplation and fill your heart with adoration for your Maker. To receive your free copy of Closer Than Angels, email info at lightbearers.org, call 877-585-1111 or write to us at Lightbearers, P.O. Box 690, College Dale, Tennessee, 37315. Once again, to receive your free copy of Closer Than Angels, email info at lightbearers.org. Call 877-585-1111 or write to us at Lightbearers, P.O. Box 690, College Dale, Tennessee, 37315, while supplies last. So a certain man had two sons. Is this story that is usually titled the prodigal son only about the one son or is there a dynamic going on between oh, yeah. the Oh yeah. Oh yeah. In fact, <laughs> I actually think the older son is the punchline to the original question back in the beginning of the chapter mm. where it said, you know, why do you hang out with these people? Right. Cuz I think the older son represents the Pharisees. Certainly. Yeah. So I think exactly that's the punchline. Correct. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's a big part of the punchline. We often tell the story as if the whole punchline is the return of the son that had been, you know, living riotously. That's that's a beautiful story and it's amazing, yeah. but the the actual punchline in that context was the son that was upset, the yeah, older son that yeah. was angry. 
The older son was a son in position, but a slave in heart. Ooh. And the younger son was a slave in position, but a son at heart, finally. He yeah. came to himself. Yeah. There, there was a transactional nature Very of his, so. his re yeah, yeah. relationship with the father, oh. too. They're both transactional. I have a question about that. Okay. Do you think that, do you think that most of us, if not all of us, when we first come to God, that we have transactional motives and that God immediately goes about the task of accepting us with those bad motives, but then helping us work yeah, out those bad really, motives, yeah. right? Yeah. And, and cuts us off. One of my favorite things about this, this parable, and, and come with me into the text here, I wanna show you this. You might've seen this before, and if you haven't, it's mind blowing. Mm -hmm. So the, the son goes off into the far country, riotous living, you know this story. Then he comes to himself and he has this sort of little internal monologue, right? Like how many of my father's hired servants are eating better than I'm eating? Mm. Verse 17, I'll just read this. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And here I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him. Now, obviously this is a pre-planned speech. He's thinking about how difficult it's going to be to return to his father, to, to his household, to his land. And he's anticipating an emotional disposition toward him. And so he prepares his speech, right? And the speech has two parts, okay? The speech is, has an A part and a B part. Let's just look at them. And so he says, A, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, I am no longer worthy to be called your son. That's the A part I'm suggesting. The B part is, make me like one of your hired servants. Or even you could say the B part is, I am no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like one of your hired servants. So A, B, this is what I'm gonna say. I'm, I've sinned against heaven and against you, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, make me like a hired servant, A, B, okay? Now watch this, verse 20. And he arose and came to his father, but when he saw him still a great way off. Now there's a ton of great information here that I'm just gonna rush over, you can circle back to it if, if we want to. Uh, his father saw him, had compassion on him, and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, now watch, he's gonna, re he's gonna re repeat his rehearsed lines. Here it is, you ready? Father, I'm in verse 21. Father, I have sinned against heaven and, and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. A, the B part is what? Make me like a hired servant. He never gets to say it. The father cuts him off. Verse 22, but mm. the father said. I love it. And what's so cool about this is, mm. Jesus crafts this story to tell this so that we understand the mentality of the son that's coming back with this transactional perspective. And the mentality of the father. And the mentality of the father. Mm. So he thinks I'm A, B, and it's that transactionalism, and Jesus purposefully tells us that so that when he doesn't get to do the transactional part, I'll come back, you know, I'll live in the outer quarters, I'll work my way back into, you know, your good graces, back into... He never gets to say it. The yeah. father doesn't even hear that transactionalism. Well, the father anticipates it. And he's like, oh, enough of that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I, We're not even going to hear this. That's masterful storytelling. Isn't it just amazing? So the father, the father, it says, it says in verse 20 that when he was still a great way off, his father saw him. Doesn't that imply, am I reading too much into this, that the father probably has developed some kind of passionate fatherly ritual of every day looking out far down the road mm -hmm. in the hope and the anticipation that maybe my son is coming back? Yeah. I think, you know, we ended the second session with me asking, you know, where's the pursuit in this story? Because you have the, the pursuit of the sheep and the, the search for the coin, but here the son himself returns. But I do think there is a pursuit, not a physical pursuit, but mm -hmm. certainly an emotional pursuit. The, the son knows that his dad's home is home. He knows that he can return. Now, he even underestimates the love, the compassion of his father, but the pursuit was there, not a physical pursuit again, but the pursuit of the home was his home. He'd been raised in a certain way. He'd been, he'd mm -hmm. been loved, he'd been taken care of, and the light was always on for him. There's two, that's beautiful. There's two things that, if we can go back to the beginning of it, because we're already please, done in please, verse please, 20, please, please. Are like, <laughs> But in the beginning, where the way that the, the parable begins is the son approaches the father and says, I want my inheritance. Yeah. So that's w the first point so here. So insulting, insulting, right? Yeah, inheritance are given at, at death. He's still alive. I so wish you were he, dead, He's dad. saying, dad, you're dead to me. And then, and then verse 13 says, and not many days after. In other words, very soon after that, he decides to go to a far country. And so there's... What a selfish there's an, brat. Yeah. There's an eagerness here 
to go to a far country. And as I was reading this, I thought, why do you want to go? Why specifically a far? There's an eagerness to get as far away as possible. And so to me, the picture is pretty clear here. Hmm. He is craving for independence. He wants freedom. He feels like he's living. He, he's I got to get out of, out of this small yeah, town. He, he wants to spread his own wings. And yeah. so he has a yeah, perception. Yeah, 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 yeah. He has mm -hmm. a perception about his life where he feels like he wants freedom. And that took me to the reality that in every sinner's heart, there's a raging for independence, right? Mm. And our conception of freedom is so warped. It's warped. Because when you, I wrote this down, you know, the idea that giving up control of your life to Jesus is in a sense actually taking control of your life. If you look at the op apostolic letters, they often begin with like Romans 1 verse 1, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ. Mm. That happens repeatedly throughout the epistles. And I wrote down it happens in, in James chapter 1. So James, they're proud to announce that they're slaves. Servants, mm. yeah. Of Jesus. Peter does the same thing in 2 Peter 1. Jude does the same thing. John does the same thing in Revelation 1. The point is this. To them, being slaves to Jesus is equivalent to being free. Right? So... That's paradox. The, the, the thing that this young man is craving for is freedom, and he thinks he doesn't have it because he has a warped conception of his father. And he only realizes that he's actually a slave when he actually leaves the very place where freedom was. Yeah. Right? So it just shows the confusion. I guess that's what I'm it, getting at. The it, confusion you know, no, no, of the psyche. He's confused as what's going to satisfy him, right? Yes. A, it reminds me of a verse in Isaiah 55 too, where it says, why do you spend money? This is God asking the question. Yeah. Why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and what, I'm, what God is offering and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Mm, so mm. that idea of freedom, of satisfaction is not found in the things that you think are going to be right. there. I actually was talking to a, an attorney and she was telling me she she grew up a, a Christian, kind of left. And I was like, oh, why, why did you leave? And she was like, well, I thought the world was going to be more fun. Going to be better. And she said, but you know what? I came back and I said, why did you come back? And she said, well, because the world doesn't care about you. Woo, wow. Come on now. Wow. She had the Luke 15 no. experience. She came to herself. She came to herself. She oh, and the NIV says came to his senses. Did you read that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's basically saying whenever we seek freedom apart from the freedom giver, we've lost our senses. It seems like sin, sin offers the illusion of freedom that Correct. leads to bondage. Oh, yep. And that when you don't understand God's law, it looks like restriction until you get deeper into it, and then you realize that it's freedom. The law of liberty. Yeah, it's the law of liberty. The Bible calls it the law of liberty. The, the, the temptation yeah. in reading the story is to see a dissimilarity or a difference between the two sons. Their mentality is the same. Transactional. It's transactional, because when the young son comes back, he says, make me like, he wants to say, uh, but he doesn't get to say, make me like one of your hired servants. Well, well listen to the words of the older son when he refuses to go into the party and the father comes out to sort of, no, no, come back in. It's, we should be throwing a party. This is great news. Verse 29, so he answered and said to his father, lo, these many years I have been serving you. Yeah. I've been working for. I've been working. And, and you can feel the wow. incredulity of the father. You, you feel, look, I never transgressed your commandment and you never even gave me a young goat. I mean, what a pathetic picture here <laughs> that I might have a party with my friends. And then verse 30, his yeah, lip the, is the out. lip is so far out. I used to tell my sons, don't put that lip too far out or a bird will come and perch on it. <laughs> Verse 30. But as soon as, and he can't even say my brother. Yeah. Yours, as soon as son this of yours. son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And you can hear the incredulity and the pain in the father here. Yeah. He says, son, son. You are always with me, and everything I have belongs to you. You don't need to work for it. You don't yeah. need to work for it. The, 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 <laughs> both sons aren't behaving like sons. They want to take that slavish, transactional mentality toward God, and you can feel the pain of the Father here in that mm. answer. You can feel it. And, and the, what I love about this parable, as with many of the parables of Jesus, it, it just, it just, it's just hanging there. Both of the like an unfinished yeah. chord progression. Both of the sons are fixated on the Father's material wealth. Mm. 
And oh, the, great and, point. Yeah, and, and the, the, the younger son loops back around to the wealth of the father himself. Mm -hmm. There is in the father a love and an acceptance. Does he get there? Do we know that? He, I mean, obviously, well, the story, it's does, that the he story gets there. just leaves us. This dangling. reminds me, Ty, of what you said in our last episode, where you were talking about the, the we were talking about the transactionalism with the lawyer that comes and says, "What must I, you know, do that I can inherit eternal life?" And you said, "Yeah, yeah, they don't understand that God is the thing." Yeah, God is the thing, right? Yeah. yeah. You never gave me a young goat, and the father says with total incredulity, "Everything I have is yours." And on that note, everything I have is yours and the party and the fatted calf and the ring and the sandals and the robe and all this stuff. The story is generally titled the prodigal son. Maybe the story could be called the prodigal God because the word prodigal just means lavish expenditure, right? right? Just pouring out. He's love spending it, love all it, love this it, love it. money on himself and the father is spending all his money on his son. Did you guys notice uh, the pattern in verse 34 and 24 and 32? This was dead and is alive. And mm, then yeah. verse 32, yeah. your brother was dead and is alive again. It's interesting. I mean, what does that mean? So clearly it's, it's possible to be physically alive, but not to be really living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ephesians chapter 2, we were dead in trespasses and sins, biologically alive and spiritually dead. Listen to this from Galatians. Ty and I just did a lengthy series on Galatians that was really fun to do. Listen to this. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. We are the daughters mm. and sons of God. Yeah. We're not slaves. We're not employees. Now, we are slaves in that larger sense that you're describing. But Jesus gives us, we give our lives to Jesus so he can give it back to us. Yeah, I think that Paul is doing a play like you use the word paradoxical. Absolutely. He's not, he's not thinking of the word, I'm a slave of Jesus in the normal sense of the word slave. He's basically playing with the word to turn it into a word of totally. freedom and liberty. Think of John 15, 15, where Jesus said, you know, I, from this point forward, do not call you servants, but friends, because everything I've heard from my father, I'm making known to you. Mm. Ultimately, God's goal for us isn't for us to be in bondage to even him, but completely free in proximity to him. We're, we're slaves to freedom. It's, it's, it reminds me of that verse that says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty for which Galatians Christ 5, has 1, yeah. made us free, right? That's Powerful. Yeah, yeah and, and the modern translations are, are even better on that, I think. For freedom, Christ has set you free. Cynthia, how would you summarize so all of Luke 15, if you could? I'm all three parables? <laughs> the whole thing. What's going on here? In the last minute, macro, summarize all three macro, parables. Macro, what's going on in this passage? God is more compassionate and more accepting and more loving than we can imagine. Because I think there is a God who is more powerful than anything we can imagine, but he is actively pursuing every single human who has ever lived. I love and that. he's just waiting for you to just give any sign that you're at all interested in accepting his What offer. did you say one time? If a pinky. If you just like, you're like, you know, I'm not sure about this, but <laughs> I a kind pinky. of am interested. Got to like, I got. The grabs, <laughs> grabs, I'll, I'll, take I'll take that. I'll take that. I'll take that. Even if you have a bad motive, you know, you could come to, to God in your first coming to yourself, waking mm, up to reality. Come, that's good. Come, coming to yourself and realizing, well, which most better. of us do. Better. Yeah, it's better over there. I could eat better. Well, Jesus, I could eat better. Jesus yeah. tells us that the motives were not fully pure good, no. and they weren't really, uh, they didn't understand the nature of the Father. We don't come with pure motives. We come we never do. and Jesus and yet, transforms our motives. Yes. And yet God is... I'll take that. Like you said, I'll take, I'll go ahead and take that. I'll work with that. And we'll move forward from that point of bad motive. And then I will emancipate you from that and take you into my love. <laughs>